Your Creative Push, Episode 50. You have to decide that your life matters more and the work that you're doing matters more than this engagement with a stupid voice. Welcome to Your Creative Push, the podcast that pushes you to pursue your creative passions. I'm your host, Youngman Brown, and my guest today is Danny Gregory. Danny has spent three decades as one of New York's leading advertising creative directors and has created award-winning global campaigns for clients like Chase, J.P. Morgan, American Express, IBM, Burger King, Ford, Chevron, and many others. Danny has written many internationally best-selling books on art and creativity. He is also the co-founder of Sketchbook School, an online creativity school that has inspired tens of thousands of students around the world. Danny, brother, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Can you maybe tell me what I missed in that intro and tell us about your personal life? You know, now that my ego is all pumped up by that intro, I'm not quite <laughs> sure what else to tell you. I live in New York City, um, and I'm getting married in two weeks, um, and oh, um, that's about that's about all you left out. Um, I'm a, my shoe size is eleven and a half, <laughs> and uh, that's about it. I could, and I could use a haircut. Oh, nice. <laughs> So uh, April wedding, um, last day of March actually. Yeah. Last day of March, yeah, okay. Yeah, I got married uh, a year ago in April. Oh, so awesome, good. I'm I'm right there with you. Good. The first year is a is a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to it. <laughs> now, your book, uh, "Shut Your Monkey," is pretty much, I'd say, the perfect companion for this podcast. Right from the first line, you say, "I wrote this book for the same reason I've written more than a half dozen others." because I wanted to read it and I couldn't find it in my bookstore. And that is the exact, in my episode zero, that's the exact reason I said that I created this podcast because I, I needed a form of, you know, daily inspiration for me to be able to do my work, um, but it didn't exist. So I made it. <laughs> right. Um, could you maybe uh, get into that a little bit and tell us why you why you wrote this book? Yeah, well, so this book is about this voice in your head. And it's a voice that everybody has. I mean, the only people who don't have it are sociopaths and psychopaths, I think. People who have no no kind of breaks on their behavior. But for the rest of us, there's this voice that says to you, you can't do this, or you shouldn't do this, or don't take a risk, or you suck at this, or you will never be able to be good at it. Um, it's the voice that comes into your head when you start to work on an idea and it starts to see doubts in you. Um, and I, you know, I've, as, as you said in my intro, I've, I've been working in the creative field for a long time. I've worked with a lot of creative people. Um, and I've seen it time and again, I've seen how it prevents people from coming up with their ideas. It helps, it prevents them from selling them confidently and it makes you miserable. You know, that's really the bottom line. Uh, I think it's, it stops you from realizing your potential. So, so I, you know, I've encountered this in myself and in others f for many years. And so I went out and I, and I started looking at books and there are some interesting and, and useful books on this, but, but I felt like I wanted one that was going to acknowledge the fact that despite um, the fact that I'm, I've written a book about this, there isn't a single defining solution to it. You know, I can't, I, I've had people say, talk to me about this book and say, it's, all right, give it to me in a nutshell. What do I do? And it mm. isn't that simple. It's, it's such a complex issue. It's so deeply rooted in us. And I didn't call the book Kill Your Monkey. I called it Shut Your Monkey because I think you can't ultimately eliminate this this voice from your head. And, and you probably shouldn't either. You probably should have you know, uh, a little bit of doubt sometimes in your life just to press, to push back against. But so I felt like I had to kind of understand what the source of this problem was and then explore its impact and then ultimately start thinking about solutions. And so that's really what the book is about. It's about that journey from, from identifying this as a problem we all have to kind of figuring out where it comes from, what its purpose is, and then trying out different things to examine how do we how do we deal with it and so get past it because i think it's really important to do that yeah i love it 
and also agree that you shouldn't kill it because then you won't have the voice and you won't know if you're a sociopath or not. Well, there's, there's that too. <laughs> <laughs> um, on this podcast, I, I bring up the idea of you know of, of the voice in your head or the voice in your brain. Um, for me, my voice is the one that says you should do it, you should be doing this, and the, I kind of push him away, or I, I did for a while. You know, like I, I would either drown him out with with Netflix or movies or, you know, the list goes on and on of distractions that I would kind of eliminate that voice. Um, is, do you think that's the same voice or do you think that's like a different kind I, of voice? I think it's, a, I think it's similar. I think it's related, but it's different. I think the voice that says to you, yeah, you could do it, but don't let's go, let's go watch TV. You could do it, but you know, I'd rather have a beer, you know, though that voice is the monkey's voice. Um, it's the voice. So I would say, it's not you who's deciding to watch Netflix. It's you who's saying you should do this. And it's the monkey who's saying, do it later, or you can't do it, or don't bother. Yeah. So I think, I think you have it backwards, at least in my, in my kind of view of the world. Because I, I, think, I think the monkey is not you. It's not you. It's, it's, it's trying to prevent you from taking risks. It's trying to prevent you from making changes in your life that will improve it. And, you know, particularly for creative people, this is a real problem because our job um, or our desire is to make something new, right? I mean, we're problem solvers. We come into situations and people say, okay, how are we going to do this? And that's what we're there for. And it's what really rattles the monkey's cage because he says, you need to stay exactly as you are. You can't, you know, it's better. I would rather that you were safely sitting on the couch, you know, watching the ball game than that you were trying out a new idea that you were putting yourself out there hmm. because then at least I know what's good. Nothing's going to happen. Bad's going to happen to you. But of course the reality is all kinds of bad things are going to happen to you. If you spend your whole time sitting on the couch, watching ball game, drinking a beer, <laughs> eventually your life will exactly you, your life will not be prepared for the massive changes that are happening outside the front door. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's like you said, there's not no like one, kind of fit for the one solution or one summary um, that you can give to anyone. And it, it, that's, I think, what makes it so difficult to kind of deal with. It's like an individual um, monkey <laughs> that, that everybody kind of has to, you know, deal with or, you know, quiet down or learn how to navigate life with. But I, I, one of the things in, in your book that really made it easier for me to kind of uh, comprehend was when you kind of dumbed it down to the science of it, how it's like the amygdala. Can you kind of talk about that a little bit? Because I thought that was that was extremely helpful for me to to understand where the monkey kind of comes from, where that voice comes from in our evolution, really. Yeah, I mean, I think it comes from um, in the larger scheme of things in the, the evolution of, of the human race and the amygdala specifically, which is that kind of fight or flight reflex, you know, um, it's, it's basically the part of you that has protected human beings. And so we've survived as long as we have. Um, it's the part that says there's something bad happening out there. Let's run away. Um, and let's, let's, um, not engage. The problem with that is that human beings are creative and we look for new solutions and we look to advance. So while, our ancestors survived in part because um, the monkey kept us from going into places that are too dangerous. At the same time, we had to resist it too because we have innovated and we have changed and we have we have gone into new places or else we wouldn't have survived on the flip side, right? So, so similarly, I think in your own human evolution, when you were a little kid, you know, your mom said, get down from there. Your dad said, don't run with that, you know. Um, you know, stop fighting with your brother, uh, sit down and be quiet. All those kinds of voices that you heard over and over again. And then you probably heard them in school as well. You know, voices that told you, I mean, it could have been uh, your, a friend who said, don't go there. It could have been a teacher who said, you know, you're really not that great at this. You know, you're probably good at something else, but you know, don't, you know, you, you're not good at math or, you know, you know, having a creative career is, you know, you could end up penniless all these voices that have come into your mind over the, the course of your life that have warned you from going into uncharted territory. Now, by the same token, um, you, you have taken risks. You have ignored your parents. Sometimes you have gone and done things that have allowed you to grow beyond it. The problem is that that voice has been 
kind of recorded in your brain. It's been recorded deep in there and it pops up at these, you know, unuseful times. And it again, rings the bell and says, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. And you, and you have to be able to separate. You have to separate and say, all right, I hear you, but that's not relevant for right now. You know, there are no saber tooth tigers out there right now. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to be running with a pair of scissors. You know, I, I'm, I can, I can transcend that. I can go beyond that, but you have to do a lot of self-examination to see where is the line, you know, where am I doing things that are totally foolish, which, you know, there aren't that many things in life as, as opposed to where am I being like so super conservative that I'm really, you know, cutting myself off from opportunities. So that's the first part is just this, this, this self analysis. But I think that there are kind of universal solutions for all of us. And I talk about them in the book at some length. You know, one of them is to have this kind of awareness and kind of dissection of the monkey's voice and, and being kind of aware of, okay, this is what it's saying. And does that make sense? Because if you allow the monkey to keep talking, he will soon go crazy. He will soon, you know, take um, a minor warning and make it into something catastrophic, you mm -hmm. know? So what he might start out by saying like, mm, I don't think that idea is that great. Your boss won't like it. And he might end up by saying, you know, your boss is going to fire you. You're going to lose your job. You're going to be homeless. You're going to die in the street. And you can go <laughs> like, well, you know, all right, let's not go that far, you know, but I think another part of it is how, you have to be able to suspend judgment in order to make creative work. You know, there's a time for judgment, but there's also a time for productivity. And I think that that's a really important line to draw in your creative life is to say, I'm going to sit down and I'm just going to put down ideas and I'm going to see where those ideas take me. And what might seem like initially to be not a great idea may in fact turn out to be the basis of something really terrific down the line. But if I kill every one of my children as soon as it's born, if I'm super critical as soon as I think of something, if I'm a perfectionist time and again, if I insist on perfection from the very beginning, I'll never get anywhere. Those ideas will never you know, be allowed to multiply and to feed on each other and to build and to come up with something truly great. So, I think it's really important, and I and I kind of describe this phenomenon that I call the honeybee. If you think about honeybees, they fly out of the hive, they go and they spend all day flying from flower to flower, gathering pollen, and then they come back to the hive. They don't really stop to think about it a lot, to assess themselves, to decide whether another bee is gathering more pollen than they are, you know, or whether they're flying in the right direction, you know, as far as everybody else is concerned. They do their own thing. They follow their plan and they come back. And day after day, that's what they do, regardless of the weather. You know, they get up in the morning, they go and they do their work and they come back. And so eventually, they f these little tiny creatures fill the hive with pollen and, and make, you know, honey. And that's a similar process that we can follow, which is to say, I'm going to commit to just making things. I'm going to commit to writing you know, one sentence and then writing the next sentence and writing the sentence after that. And eventually I'll have a chapter and eventually I'll have a book and eventually I'll have a shelf full of books. Um, or simply with drawings, I'm going to do one drawing. I'm going to draw one line. I'm not going to judge it. I'm going to wait to judge it later. Or even better, I might wait for others to judge it. But I've got to just keep making stuff. And that's, that's kind of a, a key part to getting the wheels turning and getting the monkey to just wait in the cave while you are busy and making stuff. I love it. Yeah. And that's one of the things we talk about a lot on the podcast is kind of ignoring the end result, uh, ignoring what other people are going to think about it, or even what the thing is that you're creating is. It's just kind of all about just putting the time in. And uh, so I love that. I also love the idea that you talk about in the book of, you know, the monkey moves the goalposts, you know, it's like, <laughs> you get past the monkey with one obstacle, and then he kind of creates this new block in your brain later. Uh, I love that idea because it, it totally happens. Yeah. He'll say, Oh, you know, take it easy. You know, don't be a workaholic, relax. And then you sit down and relax and he'll say, well, what are you doing? You know, you're, you're so lazy. All you ever do is sit around. You know, I mean, the monkey, <laughs> the monkey knows you, he knows your buttons better than anybody and he can push them like crazy. So, you know, you have to decide. And I think, you have to decide that your life matters more and the work that you're doing matters more than this engagement with this, the, with a stupid voice. You have to be able to say to yourself, you know what? I'm here to actually do something. 
I'm here to make a difference in the world. And no matter what it is you do, no matter what it is you make, no matter what your job is, somebody is benefiting from what you're making. And your job is to focus on that and say, you know what, um, let's say I'm here to design a, a brochure for a bank, you know, and you might say, well, that's really kind of trivial. Who cares about it? But then you might say, well, somebody might come along, read this brochure and realize that they can get financing for their house and, and you know, get the home of their dreams. So if you can focus on what, who's being helped by what I'm doing and, and maybe my obligation is to them rather than listening to this monkey all the time. You know, and if I do listen to the monkey, I'm going to be denying the world my ideas. I'm going to be denying the world the benefits of my work. And that's really a problem. That's a problem, not just for you, but for others. And so, you know, don't be so selfish, in other words, but be a bit more, you know, um, concerned about the rest of the world. And, and having that kind of a bigger sense of mission and purpose in your life, that is what you know, I think makes for great creativity in the long run is the sense of, of, of service to the rest of the world and, and trying to change the order of things. Yeah, absolutely. That, that other voice that tells you, you know, do this, like that voice that I was talking about referencing earlier that, you know, is in my head sometimes is, yeah, I think it's like everybody has that as well. And it's, especially if you have a crazy idea, like some very unique or weird idea that, you know, nobody's ever done before. Like you said, it, the monkey is like, hey, don't do that because nobody's done it before and you're putting yourself out there too much and people might not like it and then they'll hate you and then you'll die. <laughs> you right, know, it's exactly. like, yeah, or the monkey might even come up with other ways of doing it. Like the monkey's in his mind, you know, his goal is to say, I don't want you to do this thing. And so hmm. he might confront you directly and say, don't do it because nobody's ever done it before. But he might turn around and say, oh, I've seen that a thousand times. You know, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. he might he might come up with other ways to defeat you. So it isn't always that he that the voice is acknowledging that you're taking risk. His his job is to prevent you from taking risk and he'll use any means to get there. So that's that's what you have to, you know, you have to wrestle with is like, what is my bigger purpose? And if my purpose is to create this new thing that nobody's ever done before, you know, why is that important? Is it important? Who's it going to benefit? And how can I kind of hold that up as my flag and, you know, kind of beat the monkey back using it? Right. Yeah. I love that idea. One of the, the main things that resonated with me too was um, where you talked about perfection and it's definitely one of the things that delays me the most. It probably doubles or triples the amount of time it takes me to fully create something and, and finally be brave enough to kind of put it out there. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. So perfection is when we could always do more to make it better. And we think uh, somebody's going to come along and say, oh, well, how come that's crooked? Or how come that's doesn't look quite as polished as it should? Uh, I better keep polishing. I better keep working on it. Now, it's, I'm not saying that you shouldn't work hard on what you're doing. I'm not saying you shouldn't try and make it as good as you can. But analyze your motivations for perfectionism. Because I think at the bottom of perfectionism, a lot of the time, is just um, a way of delaying putting it out there. You know, mm. if, you, if you keep saying, well, it's not good enough, it's not good enough, it's not good enough, that's really saying, um, you know, I'm afraid. I'm afraid to put it out there. So the fact is, that nobody is going to notice the glaring imperfections in your work the way you are. Um, nobody else is, nobody else cares, honestly, but nobody else is paying that much attention. So if, if I'm saying the sentence to you right now, and I don't say it in the exact perfect way. I could keep hemming and hawing and saying it in different ways and, and insist that you re-record it and we could keep going on and on and we'd never get this podcast done, you know, right. but instead I figure I'm going to put it out there. Yeah. Part of it might be wrong. It doesn't matter. It's out there. It's good. It's good because it's contributing to the conversation. And let's just keep going with that. And instead of being, um, and instead of, you know, restricting ourselves and chaining ourselves down with perfectionism. The fact is, ultimately, I don't believe that perfectionists actually end up doing better work than people who aren't as concerned with perfection. I think a lot of times perfectionism can actually cause you to do lifeless work, like work that, that, is, that doesn't have humanity to it, because it doesn't have those imperfections that we all have. So I would say perfection is, you know, is, is not the same as quality. And it's not the same as as greatness even it's different it's it's an excuse yeah for sure and like you said even the mona lisa had cracks 
It's true. It's true. Yeah, he, he didn't paint. He didn't paint it that well, actually, in terms of the, the, the quality of the 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 durability of the, of his paint job. Right. And one of the things that I just wanted to touch on real quick that you mentioned that really helped me <laughs> is the idea that you know not everybody's going to be analyzing what you're doing the way that you are. It's like people don't care as much as, as you do. Um, that, that thing is really helpful as well. Yeah. I mean, there's a section in the book called, I think it's called, um, um, the, the monkey is listening to every single word you say, but nobody else really is. And I think that's, I think that's the true. Most, most people honestly are mainly listening to themselves and thinking about themselves. So you can kind of get away with, with imperfection if you want. Um, you know, if, I think I think that, and I'm not saying that quality doesn't matter, but I think quantity has its place too. What would you say is Danny Gregory's monkey's biggest <laughs> thing that he says to you? What What would you say your monkey um, kind of holds you ba- tries to hold you back on a kind of daily basis with all the different writing and all creative things that you do? Look, I wrote a book called Shut Your Monkey. And I have to go out and I have to talk to people about it. And I have to imagine all the people out there who bought this book and who are reading it and who are saying, well, who is this guy? What does he know? What authority does he have? Who made him an expert? What answers does he have? On and on and on. I'm having this conversation, you know, with you right now. And I could be thinking, well, what does Young and Brown think about what I'm saying? Um, you know, I bet you he thinks that I'm you know, full of crap. And I can go on and on and on like that. Writing this book was difficult because the subject of the book, you know, was engaged in the process of writing the book. You know what I'm saying? It's like yeah. writing. It's like the, the disease is right in there. It's so meta. Yes, it is. It is a bit too meta, perhaps. Exactly. <laughs> that's, the, that's the monkey speaking right there. So, <laughs> so, you know, I think it's like, but, but what I did ultimately feel was I thought there are a lot of people out there who feel like I do. There are a lot of people like me who are plagued by this problem and we've got to start talking about it i may not have the ultimate answers to this but i think if we can all start talking about it and acknowledging it and and getting past it we'll make stuff we'll make more stuff we'll come up with other answers maybe we'll come up with better solutions than i have in this book um but but you know i think the world will be a better place for it because i feel like we live in times in which creative people are more important than ever in human history there's so many problems in the world that needs creative solutions there's so many opportunities and new creative tools for us to use and i think it's really important that we that we harness our creative abilities and get out there and solve these problems and get and and and, um and share our ideas and and try something just try it even if it doesn't work perfectly it's better than holding it back endlessly until the problem has changed into something even worse so that's why i felt like I've got to write this book. I've got to share it. I've got to share my thoughts because um, even if they're not 100%, even if the monkey doesn't you know, give me a full endorsement, at least I'm contributing to the conversation and making a difference. I love it. And yeah, like I said, people, go and buy it because especially if you're into this, if you're listening to this podcast, it hopefully means that you like this podcast. But what I like about the book is you can take it in bite-sized chunks as well. I actually read it all in one sitting, <laughs> but you don't have to, you know, you it, it's very easy to kind of take it, you know, a few pages um, that you need until you find your kind of inspiration and then you can get to work and then pick it up when you need it again. It's the perfect book for that. So excellent. Thank you so much. Of course. Um, and Danny, before we get into our final push, I was wondering, could you quickly tell us about Sketchbook School? Sure. So Sketchbook School, and that's school with a K, um, because it's not a regular kind of a school, is a sort of an online art school, but it's really about creativity. I mean, from the very beginning, we've talked about things like the monkey. We've talked about the inner critic as part of the creative process. It's really a school that's designed to help people to tap back into their creative abilities. It, it's based around drawing and and watercoloring and things like that but but it's really at its core it's about empowerment and enabling you to be the artist that i think we all are the artists that we all were when we were five or six or seven years old and that we now wrestle with a lot of the people including me of course are are are, um are creative professionals people who said you know i went to art school and I got a job working in a design place or an ad agency or a production company. And now 
I never make anything for myself. I never mm. make my own art. And so how do I get back to that? How do I get re-inspired? And, and so what this class is, the, our school is um, all video documentaries about different artists. And every week you get a different artist who tells you all about their process, about their history, and shows you what they do and how they do it. And then the next week you get a completely different artist with a completely different point of view. We have about 20,000 people around the world have been taking classes with us now. And so you're also part of a really rich creative community that's really supportive and helps you to get through a lot of this junk that gets in everybody's way. So, um, you know, that's that's my my day job now after all these years in advertising is to is to help people to be to be the artists I think that they are. Super cool. I'll be uh, coming over there later today, I think. Awesome. awesome. Good. Please yeah. do. Very cool. And uh, it's a great resource, too. I think it's, again, a perfect compliment for this podcast. Definitely go and check that out. Sketchbook school uh, s-k-o-o-l dot com danny now it's time for our final push and this is where i ask you to reach to the microphone and grab the shoulder of somebody listening today that you've really inspired that you know is is kind of ready to go and you know hopefully maybe do their work and give them your best words of advice and really push them into action okay you've been thinking about ideas you know you have ideas things that you always wanted to do I re- and I totally understand that, that there are ideas that one day you're going to get to. There are ideas that are your side project, are the, th- the, the novel in your drawer. Start working on them and start sharing them. Get them out there in the world. Don't worry about whether they're perfect. Don't worry about whether you can get a publisher, whether you can get an, an agent. Don't worry about what people are going to think. Start making stuff and start putting it out there and sharing with other people. There's that voice in your head that I wrote this book about that's going to give you a million reasons not to do this or to delay it or to undercut what I'm saying. That voice is wrong. That voice is getting in your way. If you can manage it, you will be happier and the world will be a better place. So get to work. Get to work. I love it. Danny, thank you so much, man, for coming on the show today and for giving us that push. You bet. And you can find Danny on his website, which is dannygregory.com. Um, there you can find links for sketchbookschool.com as well as his Facebook. And also you can check out Danny's blog at dannygregorysblog.com. And you can check out the show notes page today at yourcreativepush.com slash dannygregory. Uh, there'll be links to everything we talked about today, including a link where you can buy the book, which I really, really do recommend. I can't recommend it enough. Um, But uh, Danny, thank you again, brother. You bet. Thanks so much. Have a great day. You too. Wow. Perfect guest, right? Like I said, when I first started reading that book from the first sentence, (laughs) I was like, this book was made for me. This book was made for this podcast. Um, It's that voice that I always talk about. And, you know, that voice is kind of monkey-like. So, it definitely resonated with me right from the get-go. Hopefully, it, it really inspired you uh, as much as it inspired me uh, just talking with him. Remember to just do your work, to just turn that voice in your head off, the one that tells you whatever it, it tells you. You know what it tells you, whether you're, you'd rather do something different or whether it wants you to not do it at all. You know, shut it up. Just the best way to shut them up is to, to actually go and do your work to spend time with your work and to enjoy it. You might be doing something during the day that you you hate. Um, You might be doing something during the day that maybe you don't hate, but that it takes away all of your creative drive. Well, find a way to spend just a little bit of time every single day doing something that you really enjoy, that you really love, that you feel is your passion, that maybe the voice in your head is telling you that you're not good enough to do, and just do it anyway and see what happens. Like Danny said, over a long period of time, you will build a body of work and it will start to come together. It's all about just putting in the time and shutting that monkey up. On tomorrow's show, we have Carol Carter. When you start a painting and you have a blank paper, you tell the painting what you know from the beginning to the middle of the painting. And from the middle to the end of the painting, the painting teaches you what you don't understand. And from that point on, when you get a little bit lost in the painting, you have to be humble enough to to relinquish your initial 
preconceived notions of how to solve it and go with the painting process to where it needs to take you. And then you learn something and you come to a better resolution, but you have to have humility. So every day I try to go into the studio and be a little bit humble in the creative process. Carol is an awesome watercolorist that comes on the show to talk about her creative process and her art. It's a really fascinating conversation the way she approaches her art. And I think I got the chills six times. I, I was I lost count during it, but I truly did. It was just really, it really resonated with me and it really inspired me as well. I'm telling you, this is a great week to be listening to the podcast. We've got some great guests this week um, and some great conversations. But anyway, that's for you later. Hopefully today you were inspired to do your work and to shut up that monkey. So turn off the podcast and turn off the Wi-Fi and, you know, whatever other distractions a monkey is making you put on (laughs) and go and just do your work. Have a great and productive day and I will see you tomorrow if you need another push.